Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the DXM Podcast. I am your host, Colborn Bell. I am joined today by artist Joshua Citarella. Uh, we are honored to have you. Thank you for being here. Thanks for having me. Good to see you. Good to see you as well. Uh, you know, I'm going to say time is of the essence, so we're going to push right into it. We'd love to just hear from you a bit about yourself uh, and how you came to arrive where you are today, I guess. Yeah, the... Uh I guess people know me through a few different facets, so it's always it's always interesting. I'm I'm between many different spheres. I guess my background is really in contemporary art. I studied photography at uh, the School of Visual Arts. Graduated in 2010. I was part of a uh, micro generation, let's say, of uh, broadly post internet art. Today, I tend to describe myself as an artist and internet culture researcher. I do a lot of podcasting. I do Twitch streaming. Um, I publish a newsletter on Substack. I've published uh, two books about radical internet Gen Z uh, emergent subcultures, um, radicalization online, and uh, a, a variety of other topics. But uh, my my area of expertise is really um, showing work in galleries and museums, and coming from the you know capital A professional art world. Uh, so before I did all of this stuff, I was making large-scale photographs. Um, I was exhibiting art. I was an early contributor to the Tumblr-based project Jogging. Uh, this is like 2012, going, going way back here. So my career has always been halfway online and, and halfway in the brick-and-mortar space. And so um, it's been a winding road through working with collectors, working with institutions, into crowdfunding, and I think a big part of my interest and uh, the path I've been pursuing in the last few years especially is looking at how those philanthropic structures or funding structures tend to shape the work that is produced within that context. So um, for a variety of reasons that drove me to become interested in NFTs, in um, certain crypto uh, uh, possibilities, and um, just a general skepticism of the Web2 style of social media more broadly. So yeah, my background is a let's say, a political critique of social media. And um, I, I certainly have a lot to say on those topics. So yeah, that's that's kind of me. And people know me from you know either the content stream, or maybe they know me from the art world, or maybe they just know me from shit posting online, because <laughs> I do a lot. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I think this is interesting. Uh, we are of the same age. We lived and kind of saw the world come online, right? And of course, yeah, we had this experience yeah. in, in our younger years. We were much more native than the generation older than us. I think probably this Web3 thing might feel more native to them, but there still is an inherent fascination because we saw all of the precursors that led to this thing. So maybe let's rewind it to the beginning. Let's talk about those like Tumblr days. Um, let's talk about you know what you were doing that you found so interesting and compelling. Yeah, it's uh, it's funny now because I so much of my career was in the early days uh, explaining how the internet worked to the older generation, right? Yeah, so right. I'm a millennial, I'm 36 years old. Uh, and, and the art world is, you know, it's, it's very disproportionately older. And, and we got to oversee our generation, the transition between print media to online media. And we're probably the last group that remembers what the world was like before everything was organized through a newsfeed, uh, which is an insane thing to say. But now uh, I find myself in the position where uh, my students previously, I used to teach at the School of Visual Arts. I taught at uh, Rhode Island School of Design. Now most of what I do is organized through various RSS feeds, uh, Twitch streams, Discord. But you know the uh, the followers, the participants. Um, you know I, I'm not sure if I can really call them students, but because many of them are engaged in BFA programs or MA programs elsewhere. But uh, some of them are the ages, you know, 19, 20, and they don't really know what the world was like before, like a, a, a ranking through uh, a, you know Facebook algorithms in in 2012, right? They just weren't online at that period, so it's uh, it feels a bit, I don't know, commonplace to you and me who got to see it, but uh, to just explain the very basics of that is uh, sometimes illuminating for younger people. Um, I would say that broadly speaking, my generation was uh, people who took to web two social media as a way of like staking out a creative career. They were more or less posting their artworks and doing kind of weird experiments. Um, it was a very playful space at that time. 
Um, it, it just had very different rules than today's internet. And I think a lot of that has to do with the mass adoption curve where like, you know, a few years after the period we're talking about, it's not just you and your friends posting on social media, but it's your mom, dad, aunt, and uncle, and everybody you know, and there's a lot more opportunity for context collapse. And a lot of the kind of silly shit posting irony stuff that was so important to internet culture then, you know, became clear that it had pretty negative social effects uh, much further downstream. Um, but at the time, just to give a little bit of background for the, the work on Tumblr in particular, this was uh, an era where people were broadly skeptical of galleries or institutions, um, and, and they were looking to, uh, to disintermediate that old art world. There were a lot of kind of naive utopian ideas that you could build, in some cases, literally a project space in your parents' garage. Uh, I, I built a uh, I built a gallery um, in a, quote, undisclosed location. Uh, <laughs> may or may not have been in my parents' backyard. <laughs> but <laughs> that was, I think, 2013 that I did it. And um, there was this idea that you could kind of remove all of these editors or gatekeepers and you could just, you know, quote, quote, set the artists free and so on and so forth. Uh, and, you know, the last few years, we've kind of really learn the drawbacks to a lot of those ideas. I think, you know, my uh, peer group were um, inadvertently the beneficiaries of being early adopters of Web2, you know. Um, I like to think of an example of these uh, particular uh, artist duo that was at SAIC. Um, this is, you know, 2010 or 11 or so, and they had more followers at that time than Pace Gallery did, right? So there was a big, like, a big disparity of just like, you could get your foot in the door easy and, uh, you know, 10 years later, that's totally not the case. So if you're like a Gen Z kid who's age 19, 20, you're in art school, uh, there's just no way for you to compete with these big legacy galleries. You know, absent all the collapse of mid-tier galleries, economic consolidation, blue chip versus project space, and everything else that has happened, it's just at a, at a sheer follower basis, it's way, way more competitive to the, to the degree that I think a lot of people just start to opt out of that process altogether. So... Um, yeah, yeah, that has uh, that that led us very quickly into showing it to galleries, and we had a pretty good run at that. But you know, as as with many things in the art world, uh, there's uh, financial instability and uh, explosive speculative bubbles, and then collapses. And uh, yeah, people find their their ways through different projects now. So I want to kind of like just carry on this train of thought of the idea of setting the artist free because we hear it again and again. Um, and technology, mm -hmm. I think, continues to to pull in this allure. Uh, we see artists rush into spaces all the time, whether physical or digital. They create tremendous value. That value gets eaten by capital generally, um, and then they're they're forced to kind of move on and flee. Uh, I am, I think, getting at you know, the the beginning of NFTs, what the promise was and how quickly it kind of collapsed into this almost hyper-capitalist exercise uh, where there was boundless creativity that was reduced to just kind of derivative, uh, almost like low quality memetics. And I, you were around for it. I'm curious what you see maybe is the promises of this technology and maybe places that we've overlooked and, and are, are missing. Hmm. That's, well, I think um, if I had not had this experience in the, you know, res regular like physical art world, brick and mortar gallery thing, say 10 plus years ago now, um, I don't think I would have pr been prepared to understand what the proposals, you know, broadly could be uh, th through a lot of these other uh, uh, tech um, um, way more forms of publishing, essentially. So yeah, I would say just as a, a little bit of a preface to this, that um, among my peer group, there were two things that happened that, uh, you know, a few people could bootstrap visibility on social media. And then there was this other speculative bubble due to a whole bunch of other financial circumstances, recovery from 2008, 0% um, interest rates, you know, all sorts of things that are kind of dry and boring to talk about, but do make pretty sizable impacts in the art world, especially the way that things are valued and then discussed. And, you know, the, the finances do shape the critical discourse uh, to some degree. We can debate whether that's larger or smaller. But um, there's one famous example in particular of a, a painter who was, you know, uh, loosely associated with our peer group. He was a contributor to jogging for a short period of time. And the painting is sold at, I think, roughly $10,000 
over the course of six months. It has sold and resold six times. It reaches 100K. And then the next time it goes to auction, nobody buys it. And then there's a massive crash of the assets. You know, So when I saw all of the rampant speculation in the NFT space, I don't think I was surprised, as surprised as other people, because I was just I was just used to seeing that stuff happen in the art world. Period. You know, I kind of understood like how artworks could shift between consumables into financial assets and that whole process. But uh, it did really make me start thinking that if at that time our peer group had had some other type of rules around like the total amount of inequality that could exist within say a group of 20 people or a group of 50 people or however many contributors um a few constraints on that um would have probably saved uh some of us from having to like you know dismantle our studios physically saw apart and disassemble work essentially you know go out of business in this huge boom and bust cycle and um you know if there had been like a small amount of residuals or redistribution from the people who went on to have extremely lucrative careers that might have sustained you know even like a one percent or a five percent distribution nothing massive like you know, kind of you know, standard royalties that are built into nfts now um those works that the value was collectively produced if there had been some of that that was recirculated amongst all the contributors that might have had a really sizable impact when we hit the lean season a few years later so um i don't know if any of this has yet been figured out um in in a hard-coded sense but um certainly from a financial perspective i can I can really see how, uh, in hindsight, the finances of the art world at that period shaped so many of the decisions that we just didn't realize that until much later on. You know, it's kind of like telling a, a fish that they're in, they're wet and and they just they don't understand that they're swimming in water. It's it's hard to see when you're in the moment of it. You know, I, I think this is a super important point and, and something we miss. And there's really not a lot of context or people that have an intricate knowledge of the contemporary art world and, and this new emerging kind of paradigm for art sales and distribution. Um, and, you know, I know you talk a lot about like elite capture in the art world. Uh, I think, again, this technology promised, you know, more egalitarian access, less middlemen, more gatekeeping. But I kind of have seen it devolve into these concepts you have talked about. So maybe you can just describe what this is in the art world um, and then we can kind of expand from there. Sure, yeah. Well, why don't I, um, I'll explain a little bit about my recent project maybe because I think that's a practical example. Um, yep. I would say in general, I've I've become rather pro institution in my uh, crotchety old curmudgeon <laughs> years, you know. <laughs> um, but I, I would say that uh, a lot of the rhetoric that we saw early on about removing middlemen and gatekeepers and um, you know uh, a kind of like. Uh, uh, corrupt bureaucracies and so on. You know, there's degrees to which that is true. Um, but I think what we see also in the art world is that um, editorial expertise and curation are the things that often give value to the work. Uh, and so there's a, a broad dichotomy I think you could draw here between uh, institutions and platforms. This is kind of the, the frame that I've tried to lay out. So um, what you see um, which is, I think, in some ways a result of um, a naive adoption of Web2 uh, uh, forms of valuing creative production is that everybody is more or less expected to do things for free and we should just get rid of all curators, that those people are kind of considered the bloat in this operation. Um, and then, you know, inevitably, what rises to the top in that scenario, you know, given several years, a full decade plus for this to uh, play out, um, we're seeing things like, animal videos, porn, <laughs> cute yeah. uh, uh, prank videos, um, you know, stuff that is like cooking videos, all this stuff. I mean, people enjoy it, but it's like, that's not the great enriching culture that, you know, <laughs> I want to leave for future generations, right? I've really learned to value that there's something important about what editors did and um, historical context, curation, all of these things that like the art world had slowly built up that has, uh, you know, a, I think a pretty strong use case behind it. That being said, um, there are serious hurdles with philanthropic structures, um, donor structures, and so on. And um, there can be, I think, a pretty clear ideological bias among editors and gatekeepers and curators and so on. So um, I kind of found myself in a pretty unusual bind, which was that around the era of probably 2018, a number of artists started to publish works that were 
discussing meme culture at large. Um, you know, I've done a lot of like political uh, content that's really across the whole spectrum, and I'm you know pretty vocally left wing proponent uh, for social democratic ideas and and whatever. I think I'm you know relatively moderate given the extreme Overton <laughs> window of anarcho primitivism to transhumanism to like all sorts of made up uh, ideologies that we can probably talk about later. But mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think uh, the the thing that we ran into is that the art world was really nervous about talking about some of these issues. And mm -hmm. I think one, because it, it threatened the positions of curators in general. It threatened the very foundations of what an institution is supposed to do. Uh, platforms, I think, are uh, essentially like designed to slowly erode institutions, both mm -hmm. financially and then uh, attention and, and all these other incentives. Um, yeah, and then it was just, it, I mean, to be really clear about it. it was just extremely difficult to find any sort of funding or support whatsoever. Um, so uh, Rhizome did a number of like really important groundbreaking projects around this time. Um, but you know, 2018 is a few years after like the mimetic explosion of social media. So even that is a little bit late on its own. Uh, and through this difficulty of, you know, certain institutions refusing to publish my work, refusing to platform it, um, a lot of friction <laughs> on those fronts. Uh, the inevitable thing that I was driven to was to seek out crowdfunding. So I went to Patreon mm -hmm. first. I'm now on Patreon. I'm on Substack. Uh, I'm sure we'll also talk about channel a little bit later, which is uh, my joint project with New Models uh, and Interdependence. Um, but we can we can discuss the details of that in a little bit. But uh, essentially, I think. I went to crowdfunding because it was difficult to find support through the conventional uh, modes of publishing in the art world. And that took the form of podcasts, um, PDFs. Um, I put my syllabus onto Patreon. Um, this is where the story really gets, I think, quite interesting is because while these things were, let's say, like shadow banned within the context of the institutions, the amount of crowdfunding yeah. support was really substantial. You know, it's sustained me now. I'm in year three of this project. Um, and it just seems very peculiar to me that after so many articles in the mainstream media, after so many documentaries about uh, radical politics and meme culture, there's just really no art to talk about it whatsoever. And I think that has to do with the kind of, you know, um, difficult uh, collision between different ideological interests and, um, uh, people being worried about platforming sensitive material. So yeah, there's all sorts of uh, uh, peculiar incentives that just don't really become immediately visible until you really hit the the rough edges of it. Yeah, so that uh, that that kind of drove me to where I am right now. Uh, a lot of places to go, a lot of it very sensitive. I don't want to push like any particular buttons. I continue to find really that the art that is crossing over to uh, more traditional institutions from the digital spheres or crypto art spheres to be generally pretty neutered. Um, it seems like accessible and attention grabbing, but without too much depth. And well, I just, you know, I see time and time again, uh, and I think this is like throughout, of course, all of history that art that is of its time is never really of its time, right? So you <laughs> kind of have to go to to the fringes to to find this, and it's the people who appreciate it before, obviously, the, the bureaucracy. Um, the peculiar thing about all of this, though, is that within the course of those few years, um, you know, now I'm I'm doing several different museum shows and institutions seem rather happy to publish this work. And the new museum hosted us for the Do Not Research book launch uh, last year. And I feel like uh, there was certainly a pain point in touching really sensitive content that was online that a lot of uh, institu institutions were more or less afraid of. But having proven that that stuff is actually very relevant to culture. It's mm. clearly <clears throat> impactful now in that, you know, give people the benefit of the doubt. Like a few years ago, it wasn't really clear if memes were shaping any type of uh, real world political activity. But mm. then now that's just tremendously transparent because you see groups and there's so many stories of people who, you know, transform their lives and their whole worldview through encountering content on the internet. So I think it was, um, I, I think that you know <laughs> our peer group was kind of correct in saying that those things were were important and they were just like a little bit too early on it. Um, so now it's a weird um, tightrope walk because uh, I I produce all this content which is crowdfunded, but then I also do have 
you know, a pretty constant. I just went to the University of Pennsylvania to give an address to the MFA students. Um, I, you know, two or three different museum shows that are happening uh, in, in the next few months. Like this is, I think, more or less now uh, accepted. It was just uh, difficult to kind of get people on board um, as early as uh, maybe they could have. And and I wonder, you know, as, a, as someone who really believes in institutions, if there had been institutional expertise and resources devoted to those topics, then the art world might have been able to shape that conversation in a more productive way, where uh, I mm -hmm. feel like now it's, it's a little bit, uh, you know, it's a few years too late. Who's to say what happens in the next arc of social media? But uh, yeah, I... I I really think that institutions could have done um, a, a much more uh, uh, influential job in, in the last few years if they had been keenly paying attention to these things. Uh, it speaks to a lot of things. I think it speaks to obviously this this hierarchy and now the ability of individuals to uh, become, you know, even more than brands, but become platforms. I would consider you to be a a platform, and you're operating at a speed and scale of probably like deep investigative journalism and having a pulse on culture that it would just be impossible for an institution ever to have with the amount of people, ideas, bureaucracy um, that, that has to happen to occur for a decision to be made. That is, that's also true. Yeah, institutions are, um, they're, they're slow. Um, and I think they're slow for a good reason, right? Like uh, it would be a shame this is a silly example, but like, let's say there's a meme of the month and it's like baby Yoda or something like that. And then you have a curator who's like too narrowly focused <laughs> on the newsfeed and they decide to do a whole exhibition for the meme of the month. Like that would be a waste of everybody's time, you know, and certainly yeah. um, if, if the institution is in some way state funded or, you know, just given like generous tax breaks through being a nonprofit, like that's kind of a waste of public funds too, you know? So there, there's definitely things that magazines and news feeds should address and that museums should be, uh, you know, uh, on a slower pace for a good reason. I totally get that. Um, I wonder if there's um, ways to split this though, where there's something like uh, institutionally funded think tanks for aesthetic mm -hmm. expertise, because it really does seem like a lot of the mainstream journalism on these topics, uh, talking about like radical subcultures on the internet and mimetic propagation specifically, a lot of the mainstream journalism on that was just, uh, it had a pretty loose grasp. You know, like mm -hmm. the journalists hadn't spent a ton of time themselves. You have to be really immersed in these subcultures to understand all of the lingo and the coded language and so on and so forth. So um, I wonder if there's like, I don't know, some type of institutional resources that should be just tapped to have like people who come from a background of aesthetic expertise to like do that important work. Mm -hmm. um, because I mean, to a certain degree, now finding myself in this world of crowdfunding out on you know web two platforms let's say 2.5 roughly with patreon or substack or something like that um i really do feel the constraints of the attention economy that uh unfortunately in that context of um you know everything should be free ad supported media uh people get paid like pennies a word for the articles they write where you know Many many years ago, you could uh, afford to feed your family and like lead a, a middle class life off of uh, being a journalist, and that's really not the case now. So I'm acutely aware of the constraints of like having to optimize everything you do, having to put a sexy selfie on your academic essay, having to like you know play to the attention economy with every curve, uh, with every project. <laughs> Otherwise, you just sink in the you know recommendation curve and so on. Uh, something that has come up, I cannot tell you how many times this week is the idea of like the content creator as a rent seeking participant to the algorithm of Twitter, Instagram, um, and having to design and create art, of course, that appeals to the algorithm. Uh, and I hear lamentations from people all over, you know, that they, they have to continue to create to almost like feed the beast. And it doesn't particularly feel <laughs> from them anymore. Uh, and I hear, I hear a little bit of, of, you know, hints of, of that as well in what you just said. I think burnout is probably a real thing, you know, um, if you're producing that frequently, um, just for example, like doing one or two shows a year in the context of the capital A art world, I've now published almost every week for three years. I probably make, you know, three posts a month, which is a podcast. Um, a newsletter, uh, something else. I also stream for at least two and a half, three hours every week. So, so it the 
the speed of publishing is is much much faster. Um, I mean, this is I think how we start to get uh, interested in other types of Web three type solutions because um, you just realize like the affordances of those institutional structures that you used to work in before and what the real drawbacks of uh, ad supported media are in particular. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I guess. Uh, what led me down the route of uh, looking into these things is that um, I started a conversation with New Models, uh, which is a podcast based in Berlin. They're also um, uh, an online community. They have a, a Discord um, and uh, they have a, a news aggregator site, newmodels.io, which is literally my, my homepage uh, on my browser. Uh, also, Interdependence, which is um, Holly Herndon and Matt Dryhurst. And we started having these conversations of like, we noticed just, you know, in a, in a pure like business sense, um, we had a lot of subscriber overlap that there's very few podcasts or online content streams that have been in the proper art world and then exited to crowdfunded platforms. That's actually mm. a very rare thing to do because of so many of the differing incentives between those two uh, funding structures. And so um, we started thinking about, you know, how can we work together rather than being in competition with each other, right? Because, I mean, we were literally just like competing for subscribers where someone would unsubscribe to Josh to then subscribe to new models or to interdependence. And it's like yeah. something about this system doesn't make sense. And then, you know, at that point, it really does just become like a technical question that um, these are not like very complicated things to implement, right? I mean, to their credit, Substack now has implemented a lot of these tools. And I would say that, uh, a good portion of that is actually due to the pressure that Web3 exerted on um, those more conventional, you know, Stripe processor payment uh, type of platforms. But um, it, it just became very clear that, like, there wasn't a way to collaborate through that space and to, um, you know, to squat up more or less rather than for, you know, atomized individuals locked into their own platform having to compete with each other. So, um, yeah, that... That conversation took place over like the course of a year, and we made a lot of difficult decisions. Um, and then we uh, announced Channel, and we uh, made the Season Zero NFT, which is, I imagine, for your audience, many people may be familiar with this. But just um, if you haven't come across it before, um, uh, briefly described uh, the incredible artist uh, Sam Rolfs made these um, NFT designs for us, and we sold something like... Uh, I forget the, off the top of my head, like uh, 660 of them. Um, so you get the NFT. This is a token enabled RSS feed, which gives you a single stream of content. That's a lifetime subscription to Josh's podcast feed, new models, podcast feed and interdependence. So, um, you know, essentially that was people paying, we called it a lifetime subscription. They were paying, I think three years of a subscription to all podcasts in advance. Um, and then that has been kind of running in, in the background successfully now for like, I guess we did it, uh, almost this time of January last year. So it's been like 13 months and yeah, we'll have some, uh, I think pretty big news on that in the very near future, but, uh, kind of waiting for, uh, all of our team to get together before we make the public, public announcement. But that, um, for me, that represented a way to kind of get out of this, um, this trap of Patreon and Web2 platforms, platform lock-in, especially talking about a lot of the sensitive content. Mm. Um, you know, a lot of the memes and stuff that shows up on my feed are, these are not my own beliefs, but they are like conspiracy adjacent. I'm offering a kind of critical view onto that content. But in, in representing it, I also have to kind of show those memes and screenshots of those communities. So I'm always getting hit with like shadow bans and, um, you know, real, real lot of friction on the big platforms. So um, some of those uh, Web3 solutions really start to look very, very uh, appealing by contrast. So yeah, that, uh, that kind of uh, brings you from the whole art world, seeking out funding, hitting the terms of service, looking for other funding structures to produce quality work. And then, yeah, Web3 becomes like a very appealing option in light of all those things. And obviously this is a very hot button topic right now, but I, I imagine, well, I'm curious how you feel about, you know, like creator royalties and that ongoing secondary revenue stream um, in just like continuing to support and inspire the work that you do. I think that's a, I think that's a fantastic thing. And there's really so many um, 
there, there's so many historical precedents of artists trying to implement these things. Um, you know, you look at the uh, uh, Siegelob contracts from like the 1970s. There's just, I mean, um, years and years in the American context of people trying to push for these things, but unfortunately unsuccessfully. For whatever reason, um, I mean, I think it's great that so many people put in you know, a 5% royalty on some of these works that uh, exchange hands over the years. So that um, that just seems like kind of common sense that's <laughs> built into music. It's built into, I actually ad advise on some music and I have some minor royalties from that stuff. Like, it's just like the going logic in every other creative sphere. Uh, and then for whatever reason, hasn't been implemented in art. So um, I think that's great to have as a standard practice. And um, I really hope that it uh, persists because I could certainly see how competition would drive that thing out. So yeah. the more that we can push for it to be uh, an industry standard is is super important, you know, because when things are going, when, when it's the boom, nobody thinks about this, but when it's the lean years, you'll be very happy to have that, you know, small trickle. Well, this is where I think we really need to begin to separate art from NFTs uh, mm -hmm. as, as its own culture, its own category, really like mandate and expect these things I can understand why people don't necessarily feel like they owe Board Ape Yacht Club like 10% of everything that they might just be trading in whatever a day. Mm -hmm. um, so, but I, I feel this struggle eternally. You know, it's, it's hard to know the intentions and motives of the people that exist within this ecosystem when it is so financialized. And if this is, if we have laid a framework to encourage and bring more people in and like, what is it that is going to like cement this culture and not so much just like the, the blockchain as a legal contract, but creating a, a sense of a social contract around like customs and expectations of people that participate in this ecosystem. Yeah, I mean, I guess this is um, probably one of the most salient criticisms of uh, any type of artist royalty is that because most people don't make a full living off of their work, they usually do some other type of work that um, it it's hard to build like a big demand or, or support for that just because there's so few people that would really benefit from it. Um, I mean, all of that said, uh, I, I think it's uh, just clearly common sense, a good idea to have as a standard practice, or right? you know, some, some percentage of artist royalties. Uh, but we should not mistake building in artist royalties as a uh as if that would be the you know be all end all fix for the precarious life that most artists have to lead you know so i mean my own political background is i spend i spend a lot of time talking about um uh, um, politics, uh, uh, elite politics in the media and the academy and so on and so forth. And, you know, my kind of ideal uh, art world for, I think, most creatives would be something like there's, uh, you know, the, the just the bedrock of social democratic benefits, like kind of common sense policy for any advanced nation uh, in the world, um, national health service, uh, cradle to grave, um, you know, education, subsidized fuel, um, you know, things that like you, you broadly see in like, I like <laughs> Denmark or, or Finland or something like this. That all sounds great to me. Um, artist royalties are not going to give you a uh, uh, you know, maternity leave or something like that, right? So right. we shouldn't overstate the case. But if you're an artist and you're pursuing a creative pursuit, uh, it's wonderful if you can earn some amount of a living from that and that you should be, you know, appropriately paid for your work. But you probably shouldn't be entirely dependent on it because what that, you know, similar to the, the incentive question of going out on the platforms, that tends to shape quality artwork in all types of peculiar ways where, you know, if you have experience in the market, um, a 30 by 40 abstract painting is going to do much better than a representational photograph or a installation piece, or God forbid, if you're doing performance work or whatever. <laughs> so, you know, the idea of like art turning into, you know, an aesthetic uh, consumable, something that you hang on the wall to appreciate for its beauty versus the ability to resell it as a financial asset then totally shapes all of the work. So for me, my preferred solution for some of those things is to have like a society that has, uh, you know, less 
tremendous inequality that characterizes contemporary life right now. Mm. People can be somewhat reliant on the market to support their work in part, but they can also do, you know, other types of freelance uh, work that will, you know, bring in whatever it is to meet their overhead. And there's a lot of, you know, I think decades previous to this, I live in New York, artists who would come into the city in the 1970s and 80s and they would work part-time waiting tables, but then be able to afford rent, a studio space, and materials to make unsellable experimental video work. And I think that sounds that sounds pretty preferable. So yeah, it's, it's hard to say that like, you know, there's a one size fits all that artist royalties is gonna uh, usher in the creative utopia. So it is really a multifaceted solution, but artist royalties is, is I think a no brainer on this, you know. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I continue to see various sorts of experiments through through DAOs, through uh, artist collectives, um, ways that they can support and encourage each other. There was obviously a lot of, and this is a bit of a lost tradition in culture of people who made big sales in the beginning would go, they'd buy work from three or four kind of up and coming emerging artists. And these were wonderful signals that was really creating um, some something very, very, robust that led us to where we are today but it just seemed to have gotten so just wild and overblown and, and noisy and i think the burnout was was real um so you know i i think maybe we should go sideways because i feel like they're i'm, I'm curious why you explore uh like these fringe radical political I don't. Mm, Why do I do this to myself? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I mean, if you think there is like an art there, or or where you think it's it's taking you, or uh, how so many of these voices end up dominating, coming back and like dominating um, cultural conversations. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it really is. Uh, it really is very clear how impactful the online space is for like the whole media class for, um, you know, political discourse in general. Um, and, you know, now that's like totally common sense, but a few years ago, this was like, <laughs> that that opinion was met with uh, quite a bit more friction. So I, I think I would just, I would just say that like, the reporting in mainstream media was, um, was not good. And I thought I could uh, offer a more salient, coherent analysis of what was happening in these spaces. I also saw a lot of people who were, you know, I was a kid who spent way too much time on the internet and I, you know, sunk a, a lot of my teenage years into video games and like communities today that would probably be much more politically radical just because the, the way that internet culture has turned out. So um, I empathize with a lot of these, uh, you know, I should mention that the, the demographic, the age range of this is, is usually much younger than people expect. So when you're mm. talking about someone who's like a, you know, horrible right wing troll on the internet, um, this is often like a 14 year old boy who doesn't really understand anything about politics or culture and mm. is kind of like in need of some better influences. Uh, and I was kind of just through watching these communities back from the Tumblr days, you know, following like, you know, ANCAP. Uh, shit posters because their memes were always hilarious. I saw those kids double back on a lot of their, you know, civil liberties stuff and their their kind of commitment to uh, individualism, and then go for this really, you know, authoritarian right wing stuff. Um, and I knew I knew that they were much younger. I knew that they were really impressionable, and um, it just seemed like they could really benefit from counter messaging in that space. Um, somebody just, you know, sitting with them like explaining the idea and then like offering a different um, alternative. Uh, and, and that was just really devoid of the space. You know, it was, it was difficult to have these conversations. So um, I wanted to uh, offer some writing about that. I saw that there was an opportunity to intervene that could like have a different outcome uh, in a lot of people's lives. And, mm. and, you know, maybe much further downstream political discourse in general, if we understood that these were largely kids that were doing some antisocial behavior rather than like, um, you know, all of them being dyed in the wool, uh, you know, political radicals. Mm. So yeah, um, I, I pursued that quite a bit. Um, I think one of the reasons I've stuck with it is just because uh, nobody else seems to be writing about this stuff. So I kind of can't like, uh, if I don't do right. it, I wonder who will, that's the thing, you know, it's like there's a few people who came from the art background who could, you know, talk about internet culture in a certain way. Um, and then the other thing that has really kept me with it in the last few years is that, as I had mentioned before, I took my syllabus and I put it on Patreon. 
um, a reading group then formed in the Discord, and then all of those members uh, just taught the material to themselves. Uh, they also started a blog from within the Discord. Do Not Research is the name of this organization. Um, today, it's a arts organization that is published. Uh, I don't know if I know all the numbers off the top of my head, but I want to say something like 210 essays, yeah. artworks, uh, video pieces, uh, artist portfolios, writing about internet culture. There's 159 unique contributors. A lot of that is collaboration. Um, and, and all of this is built like, all of that I think is evidence of just how much creative work was actually interested to talk about radical politics and mimetic culture that wasn't finding a platform, wasn't finding visibility or resources in the mainstream institutions. And so I've kind of become like, I, I feel like a responsibility to platform those things because I think they're influential and, and important. So yeah, I, I guess I would just say that like one of the reasons that I've stuck with it is because there's clearly a lot of people who are interested to talk about these things and producing quality work. So yeah. that has been, you know, the motivation to do this for, we're on year three of the project now, so. Last word is, is yours. Anything you'd like to share, definitely let people know where to find you uh, where to listen, subscribe, if they want to get in contact, how to do it, uh, and then we'll take it home. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. This was uh, super fun to get to talk to everybody. Um, I guess uh, you can find me on socials. Everything's under my name, Joshua Citarella. Uh, I'm on Instagram, uh, uh, Twitter. Hard to find me on the big platforms because of shadow ban and stuff like this. So uh, Substack is the easiest place. Also on Twitch, uh, Patreon. Um, and if you're uh, if you're looking to subscribe to a channel, you can get the Season Zero token, uh, and then you'll get my podcast, new models and interdependence all in the same feed. So yeah, yeah, anywhere, anywhere you prefer. Um, yeah, thanks for having me. Uh, Pleasure. Great to talk to everybody. Yeah, yeah, this was awesome. Uh, really appreciate you, all the insights uh, and really thank you for the time. I'm Colborn Bell, we're with artist Josh, uh, Joshua Citarella and thank you to Minty and that's it. Breaking news. Breaking news.